Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. Our brother spoke about uh, David. And um, I need to tell you something about David. You know, sometimes you read so much of the Bible and you miss the real thing you need to get. When David was running about, running away from Saul, there were people that were distressed and depressed. There were 600 of them. And those 600 people followed after David. And you know what David did? He took those 600 and then he made champions out of them. You must have wondered why David picked five stones from the brook. And there was only one Goliath. And he used only one stone. How many remaining? I think uh, another time I'll check up with you and we'll search through the Bible. There were four other brothers of Goliath. That's why he took those five. And he took on and he took on just Goliath. And he didn't use the other four stones. You know why? He developed other giants. And as we read in Second Samuel, those other giants and champions, now they killed and destroyed the other giants. And so I'm not here to just be like a singular lone ranger, like a champion. I want to make champions out of you. Because it's when David, when he raised up all those other champions, that's when actually his ministry really blossomed. There was a time he wanted to go to the battlefield. He said, you know, you've done enough. You can sit back. We'll go ahead and finish the rest of the work. And the time is coming. Look at my head now. Almost all white. I'll sit back and say, you go ahead and do the rest. Are you getting ready? Praise the Lord. How much time do you have tonight? And you know, I, when I come over here, I always see people, they, you know, they're much in a hurry. And then when I'm through, when I'm still with my introduction, they're saying, introduction, go to points one, two, and three. And we're going to relax. We're not in a hurry. I'm not in a hurry. And uh, we're going to, you know, developing a giant or a champion takes time. If you're going to become a champion, it's not going to be in a hurry. There's no instantly made champion. And the brother says he takes me as his mentor. It takes time for the mentor to, de to kind of develop other people. And so if you are really there, you want to be mentored and you want to become a champion, a giant killer, you're going to be patient. It's going to take time. And we're going to take all the time it takes and it will be done. I said it will be done. Now tonight, you know sometimes when people come like this, uh, in a kind of, this kind of meeting, you're talking about fear not. There is a way different preachers preach. When an apostle comes and he takes the topic, fear not, he's going to have an approach. When a prophet comes like Isaiah, and he talks about fear not, he takes another approach. Now an evangelist comes and evangelist is saying, fear not. You are surprised he takes another approach in preaching. Here comes a pastor. And the pastor is speaking his subject and he says, fear not. Because of his ministry as a pastor, he is going to approach it another way. Here comes a teacher. And a teacher is talking on the same topic, fear not. He'll be very much different from the rest of them all. And then when somebody like Paul the Apostle, an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, and a teacher, he comes and he combines all that. And then in that fivefold ministry, he comes and he wants to talk about fear not. It's totally different. And so you are not going to see what you think you'll see. Because, you know, there are people that will come and they say, fear not, and just a momentary result. You are pumped up, you are excited, and then just that night, fear not, and you can take on just anything. But after that excitement, the following day, you are back to square one again. That's not going to happen here. 
That's why we're going to take time. I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to teach you. I'm going to uh, kind of take your step after step, another step. And after we're through, you will fear not. Why don't you close your eyes and pray and talk to the Lord yourself and say, Lord, tonight, I want you to speak to my heart and do something in me and write the word on the tables of my heart so that when we're through, you'll understand what it means to fear not. And the word of God will so take effect in your life. Fear not. And the Lord will so transform you to empower you that you'll not just be looking up to one man like a champion who is the only one able to do, able to perform, able to pray, able to get results. But you too will rise up and stand firmly on both feet and be able to look any enemy right in the face, eyeball to eyeball, without any fear or doubt in your own heart. And you'll be able to operate in the same spirit or the same attitude or the same confidence and trust. And you'll be able to stand before the enemy. Fear not. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much tonight. Thank you for what's ahead of us. Thank you, Lord, because as we look at your word and we understand what fear is all about, the origin of fear, and the way fear spreads to capture the whole man, body, soul, and spirit, brain, and mind. Lord, we pray that you also explain and analyze everything for us that Fear will get out of our system in Jesus' name. That you cleanse us, you purge us, you purify us, you energize and empower us. That Lord will be able to stand and face any challenge and any situation. There will be no fear in any heart. And Lord, we pray that tonight all the things who are feared, they will crumble to the ground in Jesus' name. And those who have the fear of men, or the fear of women, or the fear of unbelievers... Or the fear of so-called believers, or the fear of kind of uh, some figures. Lord, I pray all that fear you'll demolish and destroy tonight in Jesus' name. Fear in the night and fear in the day. Fear of the dream and fear of the, of the light day. Lord, I pray everything will get out of our lives tonight in Jesus' name. And Lord, every form of fear and intimidation will cancel. And will put them on our feet. That, Lord, neither demon nor devil will be able to terrify us anymore in Jesus' name. Do your work in every heart tonight. Be glorified, O Lord, and let your church be edified tonight. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you very much. We're looking at Isaiah. As we look at the topic tonight, we're looking at fear not in Isaiah, fear not. In Isaiah chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 4. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 4. And say unto him, Take heed and be quiet, fear not, neither be faint hearted. Here the Lord sent his prophet, his servant, to this man that had a challenge. And he said, Say unto him, Declare unto him. Make it plain and clear unto him. Take heed. That is, watch your heart. What goes on in your heart. What goes on in your mind. And then tell him, fear not. Be not faint-hearted. And then he goes on to say, the reason why he told him, fear not. Look at verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, 
a virgin shall conceive and being and bear a son and shall call his name what's the name Emmanuel God with us because Emmanuel is God with us and because greater is he that is with us than he that is in the world and greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world that's why he's saying fear not there is nothing to fear knowing who is for us who is within us who is around us who is behind us and who is before us fear not it tells us in isaiah chapter 54 isaiah chapter 54 we're looking at verse 4 fear not for thou shalt not be ashamed uh, what makes people afraid they think I'm going to be embarrassed before the people. I'm going to be disgraced before my peers. And I'm going to feel this reproach before my countrymen. Because of that, they are afraid of what has not come. Because they think it may come. But the Lord is saying, there's nothing to fear. Because that reproach will not come. And that shame will not come. And that calamity will not come because of that, he says, fear not, because you will not see the shame, you will not be ashamed. Neither shalt thou be confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shall not, and shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. Look at verse 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Isn't that what people are afraid of every time? They are afraid of witches, of wizards, of weapons of darkness. They are afraid of the sea, of the ocean, of the forest, of what goes on in the village. They are afraid of what the enemies are planning against them. The plot and all those things that those enemies are saying will get him down. But he cannot do it. Because he says, no weapon that is fashioned against you, formed against you can prosper. And then it says, every tongue... Every what? Tell me out loud. The strong and the weak, the magical and the idolatrous, every tongue, whatever they are, wherever they are coming from, however sharp that tongue may be, and however demonic or devilish that tongue may be, it says, every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. And then it says, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and the righteousness is of me, says the Lord. And so you see why the Lord is telling us, he says, fear not, is for us, is by us, is supporting us, and is supplying all our needs. And because of that, he says, there is nothing to fear from tonight. You'll not be afraid in Jesus' name. I want to find out, number one, what's the definition of the description of fear? The definition and description of fear. Because if you don't know what fear is all about, you might have it and not know that you have it. And when it's trying to knock at the door and it's trying to come in, you will not know that that is fear coming in because it may disguise itself and you will not know. And here you're saying, I will not fear, I will not fear. And fear is knocking at the door and you're opening the door and it's entering in and you're still saying, I will not fear. What then is the definition of fear, the description of fear? Number two, we're looking at divine declaration to the fearful. If you're fearful, you're timid, it looks like, you know, your knees are shaking every time. And your mind is kind of oppressed every time. You're under fear and intimidation every time. What's the declaration of God for you or to you? The divine declaration to the fearful. Number three is deliverance and dominion over fear. We're going to overcome. Deliverance from fear and dominion over fear. Now, this point, number one, is very important. Everything is important. But number one is so important, the definition and the description of fear. What is fear? You're going to do a lot of writing. Are you there? Do you have your virus, pens, pens up? I want to see. Uh-huh. Pens down. You remember? What's fear? Now, you spell that fear, F-E-A-R. What's fear? False experience appearing 
real. It's not real. It's not real. It appears real. And because of that, many people are afraid. And they're afraid of shadows. They're afraid of mirage. They're afraid of something, a fantasy, something that is not really there. I want you to look at Second Kings chapter 3. Second Kings chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 22. Second Kings chapter 3, verse 22. And they all stopped early in the morning, and the sun shone upon the water. And the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. They were on the battlefield, and there was a river nearby. And they were preparing, they were ready to take on the enemy all of a sudden in the morning. You know how the sun is in the morning. It's not as bright, it's not as white, it's like almost yellow and red together, purple together. And when they saw the sun shining on the river, look at what they said. It looked like blood in verse 23, and they said, this is what? Was that blood? No, it was water. That's just false experience appearing real. That made them afraid. Remember, they were on the battlefield. And remember, as they were on the battlefield wanting to engage the other part of the army, then they saw a pool of what they thought was a pool of blood. And they said, all the people are dead. Something has happened. Something mysterious has happened to them. And all of them are dead. And the decision they took, they took that decision on the basis of what they saw and they thought it was blood. How many times you have acted like that and you thought you saw something real and it's just something that was a kind of a mirage a kind of shadow in your heart and then your interpretation said it was a demon your interpretation said this is satan your interpretation said they have come again those are the enemies they are going to take me on and when there was nothing to fear, you were afraid. And sometimes it's not even prayer, and it's not fasting. It's just to think about it and look at it very carefully. And look at it again. Let somebody get near this water and pick up and draw some water out of that. You are going to see it is not blood at all. But without looking at anything or examining anything, they said, this is blood. And the decision that followed after that was that, you know, it just fell. There's no fighting anymore. All the people are dead. And they walked into the enemy territory without their weapons on. They were all dead before the following day. False experience appearing real. We're looking at Second Kings chapter 7. Second Kings chapter 7. Here we find uh, the people of Syria, the army, they were fighting against the children of Israel. And as we're fighting against the children of Israel, look at what happened in verse 6, chapter 7, verse 6. And the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of Hittites and the king of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and did what? And they fled. The king, if you read the whole story, this is the time when Elisha said, By this time tomorrow, we'll sell the, uh, the wheat and all.